when it comes to black folks especially, um, this idea of gaslighting, that what we see is somehow crazy, that people care more about that, that broken window than the broken bodies, that the violence that the state inflicts every single day, the actual violence or the abstract violence of deprivation and starvation and all of those things that choke, and to use your word, humiliates, humiliates families. The only way we can get to the root of that is to stop pretending that America is other than what it actually is. Hello and welcome to Wise is Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. What's up with pod listeners? It's me, uh, your host, Chris Hayes. I just said that. I'm sorry. Um, my head is really spinning. It, it's been a just a, what a, a crazy... Um, in some in some ways, like what a, what an inspiring uh, and also worrisome and tense and beautiful and upsetting uh, two weeks it's been in the life of the nation. It's been two weeks of protests uh, in the streets in all fifty states, civil unrest. Um, there's been some some arson. There's been some looting. Uh, there has been some violence as well. There's been a lot of violence by police officers against protesters. There's been a lot of incitement, uh, by the president of the United States. There are armed men on the streets of Washington, DC without identifying badges. Um, it feels like a dystopia. It feels like a, a crack in the wall. And, you know, I think it's a, it's both a terrifying and hopeful time. And, I've been covering police policing, police brutality, police accountability, criminal justice, race and criminal justice for a while. Um, in 2014, I was I was in Ferguson um, and we, was in Baltimore the next year in 2015 for Freddie Gray. I wrote a book called The Colony and a Nation, which is about all this. And one of the people who's reporting on this, I've been very, very lucky to collaborate on Um as a colleague is uh, Tremaine Lee, MSNBC's Tremaine Lee. Tremaine's a, just an incredible guy um, above and beyond his incredible work. He's a, he's a phenomenal journalist, but he's just also a remarkable person. He is tough-minded and fair and wise and compassionate. He's a great writer. He is exceedingly sharp, but also exceedingly humble, two things that often don't go, go hand in hand. Um, and he's, he's, he's also just a fanta- fantastic reporter and a fantastic t- storyteller. I've been very lucky to work with Tremaine. Tremaine and I were in Ferguson together. Um, we've gotten to collaborate on this show. Tremaine's, I got to say, most of the work was Tremaine's. Tremaine's work on Chicago and, and, and gun violence in Chicago and what it meant um, won this show on Emmy, um, which is, you know, was was uh, 85% the work of Tremaine and other people. Uh, uh, but I, I get to get a statue too, which is nice. Tremaine has been on the front lines of, of a lot of these stories. He's won an Emmy. He was won a Pulitzer. He's reporting now for his fantastic podcast, Into America, uh, where you can get wherever you get this podcast. And so I thought, who better after these crazy two weeks to speak to than, than my friend and colleague, Tremaine Lee. Tremaine, what's up, man? Not much, man. Thank you for having me. How you feeling? Uh. I said to you before he came on that I was tired, but I don't really have an excuse to be. I, I, my, my, I should note that my fatigue, you know, it's not the Fannie Lou Hamer form of, of, of fatigue, right. right? It's not the, it's not the deep, it's not the deep spiritual angst. I'm just like, I'm tired at the most, uh, uh cosmetic way. <laughs> just freaking, I'm just tired and have allergies. I don't have the, the sort of soul weariness that I know that a lot of, uh, black folks are, are mm-hmm. carrying around, particularly in the last few weeks. You know, what's, I think what's amazing is these last two weeks, um, the literal fire burning across this country, but the emotional heat, the emotional fire. Um, I'm just now this week feeling more like my natural self. The last hmm. two weeks have been tough on me, and I've covered this stuff, and I understand intimately uh, how the system operates, um, its faults and failures and all the, the pitfalls and pocked in between. But the emotional weight of this last death, and I don't know if it's an accretion of um, Ahmaud Arbery and then Breonna Taylor and then the Cooper incident in Harlem with the bird watcher and this white woman hits that switch and says, watch what I do and weaponizes race in that moment. And then to see uh, George Floyd's last breaths and to see the callous nature of the way he died and the idea of black spectacle, the black spectacle of death. And I think about the lynchings and you see these old photos 
And there's this amazing book called Lest We Forget, and it's a collection of photos from lynchings. And you see the white families and children all looking up, some smiling. And this is, this is how we die. And grappling with that, but then it's everyone in my circle. Everyone you turn to is also feeling the weight crushing down on them. And even as a journalist, right, you, you need to approach these issues somewhat sober-mindedly, right? You have to kind of be clear about it, say, okay, how do I tell this story, right? Um, but how do you do that when you, you can't check a part of yourself somewhere else? I, I can't leave my blackness and my experience and thinking about my, my brother and my cousins and everyone we love and know, right? We can't separate it. And so exhaustion, you know, that sick and tired of being sick and tired, um, that's a different level of it, but what we're grappling with now, man, it's just, and it's it's thick, it's thick. Yeah, I want to. You just talked a little bit about the the spectacle of of black death and of uh, George Floyd's death, and I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about that um, where where this started because I wrote a I wrote an email to the staff last week just with some of my thoughts about this moment. I thought there were three factors that were contributing to why now, right? I mean, that that's the sort of question from a descriptive perspective is, Mm -hmm. well, why now? Why are we seeing this uprising now? You know, we have encountered moments of horrifying police brutality against black men before. What has sort of popped off in this moment? And, you know, to me, the three factors were um, Donald Trump, I think, is a huge factor. I think that what he symbolizes and the way that he exacerbates all the worst tendencies um, of the sort of enforcement of a certain racial order that has white people on top. Uh, coronavirus in two ways. One, the fact that we have seen it disproportionately decimate black, brown, and indigenous communities, um, people at the bottom of the social scale who have been hit the hardest by it, that all of our social fissures have been represented in that. And also people got a lot of pent up energy because they've been locked, mm-hmm. cooped up. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, without question. And then the, th- but the third thing that I, that I, that I said, and I would like you to, I would like to hear what you said is that there's something particularly egregious, horrifying, enraging, unjust, and profound about the actual death of this man. Yesterday, uh, again, we're talking the day after the memorial service for George Floyd, and there was an eight minute and 40 second moment of silence during the service. And when you sat there and you went second by second, minute by minute, and that represented the length of time that uh, Officer Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck. And when you watch the video, and if you haven't seen it, maybe you shouldn't, because I, I personally can't shake the image of his last breath. But eight minutes and 46 seconds, in the callous nature, this man was nothing. He put his hands in his pockets. There are people saying, he can't breathe. What, what are you doing? To hear George Floyd call out for his dead mother, He's handcuffed and prone, and he's, he's, meeting, he's reaching towards death, calling for his dead mother. And I think for so many of us, it felt like whether there was a struggle, whether there was somebody was running, whether there was some furtive, you know, quote, furtive movement that led up to the moments before death, it's always been this callous. And it's always been uh, this sense of um, an entitlement over life. Right. And it's who lives and who dies. And, and black folks have been dying this kind of violent death, even though it was quite he had his hands behind his back and he wasn't struggling. But there's a violence in it um, that I think really shook us up. And there is a feeling you, you mentioned the, the political environment, the tone from set by Donald Trump and then COVID-19, which an environmental scientist likened to me as a heat seeking missile for black and vulnerable communities because of all the pre-existing conditions and the way we've yeah. lived. Um, but then to see this police kind of death and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, there is a, a feeling of being under attack more so than normal. And it always feels being black in America um, always feels like you have a target on your head and your back and your heart and your soul and your gut and your pocketbook always um, because that's all we've ever known in this country. And we're fooling ourselves if we ever thought anything else. And that's why in this moment, it's like the, the veneer and the, the veil has dropped in a way that, again, we've been around the block. I've never felt this collective sense of anger and anguish and grief. And as much as it's inexplicable, it actually makes perfect sense Mm -hmm. because it's always been this way. 
you know, you and I um, got to speak at a, a for a journalism class at Brooklyn College. Um, it must have been last year. It's so funny whenever you flash to the memories of the before times when it's like, oh, we were about, we were in a crowded room with a bunch of people. It's like, oh, can you imagine that? Remember we used to do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like I remember like navigating my way through crowded halls of people inside. Right. Um, but I was struck by you just talking a little bit about your your background, your biography. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you can just like, just, I, I would just like you to talk a little bit about where you're from, where you were born, and how you came into doing the work that you do. So I'm from. Uh... Camden County, New Jersey, um, about 15 minutes outside of uh, Camden, the city of Camden, which is across the bridge from Philadelphia. Um, and I'm, I'm, I live in a, lived in a place uh, right before you get to the sticks. So it's about a quarter of the way between uh, Philly and Atlantic City. Um, a majority black town, about um, 85 to 90 percent black, very working class. Um, you know, we all had houses uh, and yards, but everybody worked. Um, all the, the white folks that we knew were all working class or poor, um, kind of just like us. Uh, I've come from a very hardworking family, um, mother, brother, and sister, and I was raised from a very young age. And I, I think the first moment that set me on this trajectory was um, I was about seven years old, and me and my mother were watching the news, and we were watching the MOVE bombing when the Philadelphia Police Department dropped fire bombs on top of the MOVE compound. The MOVE uh, compound was a movement and there were separatists and it was just a tangle. And there had been this violent um, skirmishes between the police and this, this organization. They were Pan-Africanists um, with some funny spiritual religious stuff tied in there. There was a lot, there was a lot going on, but they had this ongoing tension between uh, members of move and the police department. But it came to this head where the, the police department actually dropped bombs from the sky on Osage Avenue. And I remember seeing, um, a naked boy running from the flames and we sat there um, in silence. And and then I remember watching roots and I remember watching Mississippi burning and my mother would have these very frank conversations about race, but it started with uh, the conversation we'd have each morning before school. She would get on a knee, look me in my eye and say, I am. And I'd say somebody, I am somebody. And I believed her. She was giving me this strength and this heft to move through a world that she knew would take shots at me, right? Real shots or, or subliminal shots, but they were always gonna be coming. You know, she, she, every gift was a book of black poetry or black history, everything was black. <laughs> we just grew up very black. Without, my mother is not a Pan-Africanist, she's not a nas- black nationalist, she's uh, not college educated, um, she was married uh, when she was 16 years old. Um, you know, she, she had her first child at 16, um, but she was just the warmest, purest person I know, um, but filled me, intentionally filled me with pride and strength. And and for me, I think those early formative years of most, without question, watching um, the Philadelphia Police Department bomb black people um, set something in me. And then my mother reinforced it. And then she armed me with um, self-pride and self-respect. And I started examining, um, examining society from a certain vantage point very early on. And I think what helped was Unlike in New York City, where the only white people you see are white people with money, right? I grew up in a place where none of these white folks were better than me. We were all the same. We, we had good friends. Robert Applegate across the street, my boy Dave Mitchell around the corner. A black context um, where most of us were black. But then we, had, we were able to have these kind of friendships. Um, but it also helped me never feel less than. Um, never feel less than. You no, know, it's funny you say that just because my, my, my upbringing in the Bronx was, was, it was different. But there was a similar, it was similar in that respect in that... It was a very multiracial, multicultural environment in which basically everyone was kind of at the same class level. Mm-hmm, like everyone mm-hmm. was kind of working middle, working lower middle class. People's dads like drove buses or, um, you know, worked as a bank teller or in a in a grocery store. It was mm-hmm. like, but and, and people were black, white, Latino, Asian, immigrant, native born. But there was no like, and this changed when I got further along. No one was like, no one had a country home. No one, like, there's no one with like, right, there's right. no one who's kind of better than you in any sort of, um, in any sort of like class socioeconomic status. Like mm-hmm. the, the, I remember like the one or two kids who could afford Reebok pumps yeah, when they first pumps. came out was like the, yeah, dude, the, that was like the, but, but, it, but it's an interesting thing because I think you're right that particularly in like the New York of now, all of that stuff is so tied together, mm-hmm. ra- race and class so so tightly mm-hmm. that that's an interesting upbringing to have in terms of 
the separability between them in some ways. Exactly. And, and it's, a, it's a funny story that, um, you know, my mother has told me about my, my buddy Rob across the street, uh, kind of a gangly white dude, maybe two years older than me. And we were really good friends. Um, but his, there was a part of his family um, that I was always told was kind of racist, right? He has uncles. And growing up um, in a different neighboring town, Berlin, New Jersey, is split between East Berlin, black, and West Berlin. It was always white. And now his uncles and my uncles used to actually get into it had a problem with each other. <laughs> it's all about race. And then here we are. This is like my guy. Rob was my boy. Um, but but I think my with, with my mother, just to kind of backtrack in this whole trajectory, yeah. um, my grandfather uh, was murdered two years before I was born. That's your, uh, they, that's your mother's father? My mother's father. Um, my grandparents had an uh, apartment building um, in Camden, New Jersey. And they rented it out to a guy um, who gave his deposit, and then he just disappeared for like 10 weeks. And he came back uh, wanting his money back. And my grandfather said, you know, it's non-refundable. So we came back one day um, after my, my grandfather got back from working uh, a late shift at a pipe insulation factory. Um, and the man knocked on the door and my grandfather stood up and he fired uh, three or four shots uh, through the door. He shot him in the neck, uh, in his jaw and his stomach. And he died in, in my grandparents' house. And from a very early age, that was part of our story about the loss of this great, amazing man. Um, he was, uh, loved CB radios. He was big daddy, right? So my mother tells me stories about hearing him talking to his CB buddies, all the truck drivers coming up and down the New Jersey Turnpike, and he was big daddy. And he cared for eight children and my, him and my grandmother. And it was like this, this man's man who was the, the, the patriarch of, of this family, beautiful head of gray hair. He was 60 years old and he was set to retire. And my grandfather's lost and I never had a chance to meet him, but the, the space created by his death um, would forever change everyone in my family. But I think the way my mother wanted to protect me somehow, not just from the shots that I would take from white folks, but I had a sense that it was always, you gotta survive and you gotta make it and you can do anything and everything and you should. And I always got this sense that not that life was fleeting, um, but you have to push and you have to go and nothing can stop you. The reality of life was always bound kind of by life and death. Um, and that death could come because it's come with my grandfather. And even on my mother, my, my mother's side, my grandmother, they left Georgia, South Georgia in 1922 after a white man uh, shot and killed her 12 year old brother, Cornelius. And so my family joined the great migration after he was killed, got to New Jersey. And then another of my grandmother's brothers was 17. He was killed by a police officer. And when I read the newspaper accounts and stories that I've written a thousand times before, um, even though he worked at a car dealership, somehow a, a cop on a walking beat saw him and thought he was breaking into a car. There oh ends God. up being this struggle. The gun somehow slides to the ground. They're fighting over it, and he's killed, 17 years old. And then to have my grandmother's husband be killed. So she had a brother, two brothers killed, one in Georgia, one in New Jersey, and then to have my grandfather killed. Wait a second. Your grandmother Your grandmother lost a brother to a white man in Jim Crow, Georgia. Then they moved north. She lost a brother to a police officer at a car mm -hmm. dealership where he thought he saw a young black man breaking into a car and then lost yep. her husband to gun violence through the door of a, of a disgruntled uh, ex, ex would be tenant who wanted his, his deposit back. That's right. Bullets chased us from the south up to the north. And, and so I think there's no doubt that that kind of that energy um, has been a part of who, who we've been. Um, and I become a journalist and, and I've been writing about these kinds of stories. And I think bound by, um, the nature of black life and black death and the ways in which we die and the different ways in which we die from, from white folks, generally, generally speaking, um, to see family members, um, move in and out of, of, of prisons, um, to see, you know, my stepbrother was murdered also in Camden, New Jersey. Um, it's just to, to feel it and see it kind of kind of fueled me because I understand, I, I deeply understand in personal ways how this system and how this experience grinds us up and the emotional toll of it. And you have to push through, though, because there, there, there is no other option. And so I tried to bring that to my journalism with the stories I tell and the people I engage with. And I do try to walk with humility um, because, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. And these are these are my people. Um, and so I try to walk humbly, man, and and tell these stories um, and bring light. 
Let me let me ask you about the 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 man that shot your uh, shot and killed your grandfather. Was there ever was he ever apprehended? He he was actually so. The man who who shot and killed my grandfather, he went on the run and there was like an APB out for him for um, about a week. And he ended up turning himself in. And he, he, he talked about how he was so angry that my grandfather wouldn't give his money back. And he actually came to my grandparents' house twice. So my grandfather worked his late shift at the uh, pipe insulation factory. He, he came earlier in the day and my uh, uncle, one of my uncles was there, my uncle Clifford. And... He asked for my grandfather, and my Uncle Clifford rebuked him. My Uncle Clifford was like a, a mean dude. Like, he was from, he went through <laughs> Vietnam. No, Uncle Clifford was, he was tall, and he was just like a mean, and he was, he, loved, he was nice to me. I love, like, my uncle, you know, God, rest in peace, rest <laughs> in peace. Um, his story is a, it's a whole other thing. He was a mean dude, and he kind of like, you know, lashed out at the dude. Um, so then the guy came back once my grandfather got home. Um, so he, he goes on the run, and he turns himself in, and there's this whole trial. And I actually have uh, the newspaper articles uh, from the Camden Courier. Um, that outlined, you know, why he did it. And it's, there are these, these quotes in the stories that I read where my grandmother recounts, um, my grandfather being shot and him saying, uh, Ida, my grand my grandmother's name is Ida, Ida, they shot me, they shot me. And he collapses in her arms. And like my, my mother remembers like her having blood on her nightgown. Um, you know, and it's, it's just, and I actually spent a lot of time in the house because, uh, my family had boarding homes, so it was actually a boarding. It turned into a boarding home later. So I spent many days in that very kitchen uh, where he was shot. When you talk about all this, the specter of death um, that 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 very really looms over your life, and that that is communicated to you by your mom. You know, I can't help but think of the stress that that produces, and that really, to me, it intertwines the two stories. One, the story of what we've seen during the COVID epidemic. And then your personal story, which you've written about in the New York Times, like, again, there is a large body of literature in health, in public health and and medical literature about the severe, severe toll in a physical health sense that stress and trauma put on a body. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your own health experience and, and that sort of scary wake up moment for you. And then... Because it seems to me like that's a huge part of the story we're seeing Yeah, at the intersection of these two crises. With, without question. Um, there's an a, a emergency room doctor in Chicago who told me once, uh, there's no such thing as uh, post-traumatic stress. It's present traumatic stress because it keeps happening. I think uh, in 2017, I had a, a heart attack. I had a widowmaker. So my, my left anterior descending artery was almost 100% clogged up. Some plaque had broken off and uh, a blood clot filled it. Um, thank God I made it, but it was, it was a serious situation. There is absolutely zero chance to me that everything that I've carried in my life as a, as a man, as a journalist, and even that that preceded me, that I also carry, that was handed to me, there's no doubt to me that that played a role in what happened because I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have high cholesterol. I, I don't have any. I'm a former uh, high school and college athlete. <laughs> There's zero way. I got to say, like, when I heard when someone told me this story, my first thought was like, for people that don't know you or haven't seen you, like that you are like the you are the picture of health. Like you are a you know, there's some people walk around. They're 40. They look like they're 56. There's some people that like, right. there's some people that have poor constitutions and you feel like they're sick all the time. There's some people that, you know, have chronic illness. You are, you just, the way that you walk through the world, the way you present, the way you've always presented me is like a picture of health, like a fit, energetic, incredibly healthy man. And when I heard that story, it blew my mind, partly for that reason. Like, holy shit. I always felt, and I always felt good. And I, but I always thought, I thought that I had a handle on all of this stuff because even when I'm stressed, I'm not the kind of person that um, projects my stress in a certain way. Like, I'm not going to lash out at you. I'm going to talk crazy. You know, I just, yeah. you know, you deal with things because in life you are confronted with issues and failure is not an option. Uh, letting anything get you down is not really an option for me. I just don't, I don't what can I do with this? I <laughs> try to find a way. I got to step on it, go under it, go around it, but we have to keep moving forward. And so with, the nature of, of the work, especially that dance as black journalists and black death and black trauma that we experience and we carry along with us and the kind that we record in our notepad. Um, I thought I, would, I, I took those things 
And I thought I broke them down. I understood what they were doing to me. But really what I think I was doing was I was taking this one and putting it in this box over here, right? I'm not going to deal with it. There's no, I took, take it, put something else over here. When really the weight of it started to sag until it exploded. And I think the lesson from that is one, understanding that connection between trauma, the psychic trauma, the actual trauma, um, how we, uh, perceive these moments in life and how we process them. You have to actually process them. And I think that's one of the things that we don't have the tools to actually, when you see a, how often have we seen the the last moments of of a black man's life? Walter Scott shot seven times in the back. Eric Garner being choked out. I can't breathe. I don't ever remember seeing white sons gunned down. I don't recall ever seeing uh, white fathers choked out to death. And we actually watch it. And we actually watch it. It's like we're watching these snuff films. Yeah. And it's acceptable because there's some level of, of violence infic- inflicted upon black bodies that is acceptable in America. Because, again, as I said earlier, it's always been. And so I think we carry around that trauma as black folks, some more explicitly than others. There it, our Chicago reporting. There are young people um, yeah. and parents who witness death and bloodshed every single day, let alone the, 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 the violence that doesn't involve a gun. The beatings, the abuse. I want to talk about that that sort of that cycle of tra- of humiliation and trauma and where you go with it, because I think that's a huge part of the story right now, both in protests and 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 in what we're seeing on the streets. I want to talk about that right after we take this quick break. The reporting that you did on Chicago that we then put on all in about these sort of cycles of trauma and violence. I mean, one of the things you, you talk about the man who shot and killed your grandfather coming to that door twice. You know, one of the things I can't I keep thinking about is the experience of humiliation. Mm-hmm. That's the core emotional subtext for a huge part of what life as a black person in America is. I think it's even more global than that. Like in, in A Colony Nation, I write a little bit about the Arab Spring and about the fact that the first trigger in that was a fruit vendor who had been harassed by the cops because he didn't have a license to vend, to sell his fruit. And then he went down to the municipal office and they were like, get out of here. And he was humiliated. And the thing is that like a humiliated person can't really do anything with their humiliation because when humiliation comes at the, at, from, from power, like what you were literally just saying, like you just got to put it in a pocket, some psychic pocket and store it there because, you know, it's like with your kids or your spouse or your friends, if you have beef, if we're, you're frustrated or whatever, there are outlets. You can, you can get right. an argument That's with your right. friend. You can, you know, sometimes you lose your cool with your kids. You'd be like, oh, just stop it. Sometimes you have arguments with your spouse that you love all these different relationships you could have where, but, but when you have the emotion of humiliation at the hands of someone with power over you, there's no place to put it. And I just think like, I think it's a huge part of the trauma. I think it's a huge part of the stress. I think it's a huge part of the violence too, because I think that like young men being humiliated, like violence becomes a way to reclaim something for themselves that has been taken from them because of humiliation. When you think back to like Wretched of the Earth, France Fanon, or for the fancy folks, France Fanon, uh, the idea that (laughs) (laughs) France Fanon. (laughs) I just call him Fanny. Yeah, it's Fanny. Um, But this idea that uh, the the colonized, you you can't lash out at the colonizer, so you you turn it inward. And I've been having this conversation with friends from all different walks of life, and the feeling is, you know, white America at some point is leaving black people and black men zero choice. Zero choice of what ha- what could happen next. There, there, can you imagine if uh, black police officers went into a white community, some, certain white communities, and inflicted any pain on their children? They're coming out with the guns, all of them. They're going to whistle, and everybody's coming in the back of pickup trucks, and they're all, all armed. Because of the nature of our relationship with firearms um, and the toll it's taken in, in black communities, everyone's not a Second Amendment uh, advocate, right? They're not activists saying, arm yourselves, as they did in the past. But there comes a point where I think people are really reconsidering our stance on the Second Amendment and gun ownership, and that the humiliation of being able to gun us down, kill us, hurt us with impunity, because they know when you show up to that, that crowd, you know none of these black folks are who are protesting have guns, right? Unlike the stay-at-home protesters who are all coming armed to the teeth. 
You know that. You're taking advantage of the fact you can shoot those rubber bullets. You can beat us with batons. You can do all those things because we're, we've never been those people. You, you say, you know, these people are, are savages. We're, savages? Savages. As we've seen, we've seen the historical context of what a savage is. Well, the wildest thing about that to me, and I keep thinking about this, is that you've got two, roughly two political coalitions in American life, right? And that, that oversimplifies. But, but in the mm-hmm. roughest sense, there's two big tent coalitions. One is overwhelmingly predominantly white. The other is much more multiracial. The one that's predominantly white is the one that is most committed to the Second Amendment and, and also carries. Like, mm-hmm. that's a big part of what they do. And just like, we, and we saw it. We saw it at the, at the lockdown protest. Now, thank, I mean, thank God the people out in the streets now are not the the coalition that carries because like people talking about the, the unrest and the violence and like, I don't like things burning. I don't think it's good to burn. I sure as heck, it breaks my heart to watch like business in the Bronx be broken into and looted when they're mm-hmm. struggling to get by in COVID. Like all of that it breaks my heart. Imagine if everybody had a gun, yeah. like, hold, it's, I mean, <laughs> but, but, but let's go to counter argument here. What if those, on the, the, that far right flank, not even that far, just the right flank. What if they're onto something? What if we show up with these guns? Right, and then you don't get tear gassed. And then guess what? We can have this conversation on this level. We can do it this way or this way. It only gets to the fire and the burning and the, 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 the leaking of rage and floating of rage in that way is because there's no other option here. I mean, that's the arm yourself or harm yourself. I mean, that, that, that was the, 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 the you know, the, the, the Panthers took that mm-hmm. line and like, and you know, this is a, a well, a, this is a, a little known fact to some and a well-known fact to others that like Ronald Reagan's move towards the first big gun control legislation at the state level was when the Panthers started arming themselves and showing up the state, state capital steps. That's right. They, they showed up, walked around <laughs> and the sight of these black men and these disciplined black men, because you can handle, um, you know, some some rab- rabble rouser. Right. But right, when you show right. up disciplined and armed right. and that's another thing from from my youth that I remember hearing stories about the Panthers following police with a law book in one hand and a shotgun in the other. Yeah. And that levels the conversation, because, again, we can have this conversation like gentlemen. Or we can have this conversation another way. And again, I'm not advocating. No, I know you're not advocating, but it, but to me, it's like yeah. I I hear that because like that's where that's coming from a a certain tradition, b a certain live reality. But it's also to me like this cycle of violence, trauma, and humiliation that that is that is to me the cycle of many forms of oppression and then many forms of lived reality in, in, a, in communities and in, say the West side of Chicago, where you're done reporting on the South side of Chicago or in East Baltimore and places like that. It's like, how do we level, how do we break that in every way? Yeah. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is my dream is the cops aren't armed as opposed mm-hmm. to everyone's armed. <laughs> like the, 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 <laughs> right. the, the future, that's an option. I, I guess there is another option. I, that's it. what I'm saying. Like <laughs> the future I wish for us, the vision I have is a vision where like the police aren't armed. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because, I just think that like it's America's a super violent place. It just is yeah. a very, it, that is not a, that's not a, I'm not saying that as like a metaphor or something poetic. I, this is like an empirical fact about America. America is a violent place. It is a very violent place in, in just like the OECD rates of violence. It is a very violent place in the amount of wars it is in mm-hmm. and how often it's in war. It's a very violent place in how many, much money it spends on violence. Yeah. Like it's a violent place. Mm-hmm. I, I think part of that inherent violence that, that we, most of us recognize because I don't think some people I think live in this this bubbled world. Um, but but I think when it comes to black folks, especially um, this idea of gaslighting, that what we see is somehow crazy. That um, that people care more about that that broken window than the broken bodies. That the violence that the state inflicts every single day, the actual violence or the abstract violence of deprivation and starvation and all of those things that choke and to your, to use your word humiliates humiliates families where you have to turn that trauma inward. Um, I think the only way we can get to the root of that is to stop pretending um, that America is other than what it actually is. I love that idea of the colony, the colony, what this place actually is. Now, because we have the veneer of technology and it, it works relatively well because the cogs, the machine is actually, it's not bad. Man, when this thing is actually working and the ideals that are supposed to be fueling this thing, um, but when you actually look at the machine, the violence that is 
it it has always taken to maintain this kind of caste, <laughs> the, the, the violence it's yeah. taken to maintain this system, we've never seen the likes of it. We actually never have. So wait, I want to I want to come back though. Your mother had this 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 sort of upbringing that was was really drenched in a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of violence and trauma. She sort of instilled in you this sort of sense of self worth and dignity and and kind of courage. You you then went to a, a really interesting high school, right, from, yeah. from Camden? That was, like a, a, I think, a pretty formative place for you? Yeah, it's called the, uh, the Milton Hershey School, um, which, you know, it does hold a, a special place in my heart. All my best friends are actually my brothers and sisters from that school. So in 1909, uh, Milton and Catherine Hershey, uh, Milton Hershey is the founder of the Chocolate Factory in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He built this entire town uh, to support his workers and his factory. So the entire town was literally a factory town. In 1909, uh, Milton Hershey and his wife, uh, Kitty, uh, founded this, what was then an orphanage. They couldn't have children. So they they opened this school um, for poor white orphans. A little while earlier, uh, Milton Hershey sold his caramel factory in Philadelphia for a million dollars, got rich. Hershey is supplying the world, right? Um, So what started off with as a school for poor orphans evolved into um, poor children, period. Uh, it has an endowment of uh, 13 or 14 billion dollars. It's completely wow. free. Uh, my best friends were all from, you know, Philly and New York and uh, some from California and Florida. And what it did was allowed kids with some potential to not worry and burden your family with the financial costs of your education and your well-being. We had a barbershop in the school. We had medical facilities in the school. If you had a dental appointment, you would leave class and go get your, your filling <laughs> and then get back to class. Um, there, it's a student home setting, so uh, you have co- uh, student homes with uh, boys, student homes with girls. It goes from uh, uh, kindergarten up to senior senior year. Um, it really was so formative because I was allowed to be in this safe space, and you know, flex and work through work through all my things, and work. Everyone was working through their stuff. Everyone coming from these situations where uh, some were relatively mild. You know, I feel like my, my case, we were a very working class, didn't have much, but we were, you know, we were straight, always had a house to some of my friends who grew up in much tougher situations. Um, and also another, I think in my formative years in dealing with race and class, another situation where what's really interesting is the school is about um, half white and half black, Hispanic, and Asian. And again, a situation where we're all coming from the same class. And a lot of these white folks were coming from some really rural, poor, <laughs> rural communities. And we were all together and we were all able to flourish um, in a way that I don't know. I'm sure I would have been okay. I feel like I feel like I would have been okay, but what is okay? Um, but this school gave me the opportunity to really shine. I mean, I was um, a scout. I was building model airplanes. I was writing for the yearbook. I would play football, basketball, track. Um, you know, it was... It was an amazing time, and I owe so much to the Milton Hershey School. And it's just because it's like the, the, the work of giving young people an opportunity. When we talk about these systems failures, you know how many brilliant people I know who never had a chance because of their, their, their bellies weren't full, because there was always a sense of, uh, of not being safe, the actual trauma, again, that we carry. But to be in a place um, that isn't perfect by any means. I used to actually battle because some of these house parents actually were racist. And I can remember a conversation with one house parent and a lot of kids weren't hip to, I was already reading stuff and he brought up the bell curve theory. Right. Oh, and I'm God. like in seventh, eighth grade and I'm like, a house wait. parent, wait, 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 a white house parent yes. is bringing up bell curve to a, a seventh grade black boy. Oh, because he was talking to a bunch of us because what he, he was trying to make the point that when he was in the army, there was a reason why uh, blacks weren't officers. Oh they my didn't, they didn't God. Have, right. And I'm like, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, do you mean to tell me that, first of all, <laughs> understanding how the curve is that, what, 30 percent of us are marginally and we don't use this word anymore, but marginally retarded. Is that the, so I went through the whole thing and I would cause trouble like that. But they couldn't really do anything about me because I was really good in school. Teachers like me. I was on a football, basketball team. My coaches were <laughs> teachers. So I was like I used to move through. I used to cause some trouble, man, because you couldn't do anything about it. Because what are you going to do? Because one, I'm right. And that's how I feel as a journalist. It might cause some trouble, but I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to be right. But if you're right, if listen, you're right. And so that that school um, was another one of those steps where it helped me uh, get closer to the the me I am today. I was on that that road then, and it was it was a again much praise to the Milton Hershey School. Then you went to college, and did you start writing? Were you writing the paper in college? Were you like and you? Because I think you did journalism right out of college, right? Yeah, I was I was always writing, but I, I went to um, Shippensburg University on a football scholarship. So I went to play football, right? I was a decent player. You know, I was, I was all right. What'd you play? Uh, tight end, tight end defensive end. Okay. 
Um, and then I went to college um, as a, a tight end, and then they moved me to outside linebacker. But I was pretty. I was kind of small. I was like 190, you know, six one and six two, 190. I wasn't yeah. that big compared to some yeah. of the other guys. Um, and I had a bunch of life stuff, bunch of like stumbling blocks. Um, and I ended up leaving after my first year. Um, I was just rocked by a bunch. There's some personal stuff that happened, and so I went back home and started at community college. I went to Camden County Community College, another one of these institutions that bless you all, giving a lot of people an opportunity um, that otherwise couldn't afford it or, like me, took a knock. Community colleges are one of the most important institutions in America. Oh. Um, Just like, and there's so many people working in those institutions who are so phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I've known community college teachers spent 40 years. I I just like, it's some of the, some of the, some truly great people in America's community colleges. And I got an associate's degree literally for like $4,000. Or like five thousand. It was something like like that. But it, it also gave me another opportunity where I started writing for the school paper. I was I was going to Philly. I was writing poetry. There was a hip hop magazine um, called um, a Philly Word magazine. So I was doing profiles on Allen Iverson and rap groups and uh, social stuff. Again, every step along the way, I had the opportunity kind of to flex a little bit, right? And I kept pushing to flex a little bit until um, finally I went back to Rowan University and uh, finished up two years. Um, in like a year, I man, I would go to school at like eight in the morning, wouldn't leave until like seven at night. Um, but I was like determined. And it wasn't until um, a professor said, you know, you should really think about getting an internship. And I really had no one, none of my family or friends were professionals at all, right? We were working people. So there was no one ever saying like, oh yeah, you know, if you want to be a journalist, you need an internship. <laughs> you need to be like actively working in the business. And so one of my professors suggested I apply to the Philadelphia Daily News and I got it after a whole string of writing profiles on campus, uh, writing about the move bombing. Um, members of the move organization were getting out of um, prison and just, um, you know, the, Iraq, the war in Iraq was going on. So it was like all this stuff. And I, was, I was expanding the kind of journalism that I was doing and got into the Philadelphia Daily News. And I still thought somewhere in my head that I was going to be Richard Wright. I wanted to write these beautifully written prose. And I ended up in North Philly where bodies were falling from police bullets and neighborhood bullets. And I, I, I would often get there listening from to, on a scanner, getting there before the detectives get there. And I remember seeing uh, young men who looked just like me, looked just like my brother and my cousins. And some of my brother, my brother and some of my cousins were also just moving around, moving around in ways, you know, that we always feared could get you hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can remember, feeling for a moment that I don't know if I can do this because the level of empathy that I feel for these families, seeing, um, looking in my mother's eyes, and there are a lot of people who won't know this feeling, looking into a mother's eyes whose son or daughter just never came home again, never came home, and they're standing across from police tape, and the lifeless body of their child is laying on the pavement. The kind of sobs that you hear, and then you have to go, I have to go ask you a question, I have to go ask you for a picture. That's not my place. And I remember there was there was one case, and I think this changed my 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 entire framing of what I wanted to do with journalism. It was in North Philly, and there was this moving gun battle between two cars. And Philly has these very narrow streets and row homes that are like stretched, you know, they're long blocks, long narrow blocks, and there was two guns shooting at each other. And they shot a little girl who was like eight and a little boy who was like five. And I go to Temple University Hospital where the family had gathered and I walk in there and it's like 50 people as part of his family and friends. And I walk in there and I I learned to identify at that point um, the family members, right? By the level of grief they'd show. I would always try to get like Mm. one or two removed and get close. And so finally I saw the mother and I could tell that she was the matriarch. And I go to her and I say, ma'am, you know, I I, I know um, that this is an obviously tough time, but I wanted to ask you a couple questions. I'm with the Daily News. And she looked at me. She was like, like, not now. Like, are you serious? And I kind of slunk away and I went out to the lobby and I sat there and I, I literally was almost in tears because who am I? These children are shot and who am I to show up a, a newspaper story that was going to be about 250 words long, a newspaper story. But two of the younger um, family members came out and they said, we know you're trying, you try to do the right thing. You try to do your job. We'll talk to you. And I always, but I always came humbly to these families. You're doing me a favor. We've been around the business long enough. There are people with these egos, these outside egos. How dare you? 
how, how dare you? Who are you to write some words and disappear once the, the, the body is lowered into the ground? Even, you're going before then. These families are left with that pain. They're left with that trauma. And the lasting image of, of a journalist and a reporter might be you being an asshole. Yep. Might, might, might very well be that. And so I learned to move um, with extreme empathy and, and I, I move, try to move with grace. And I always move like, you know, I'm here to help elevate a piece of your life. It's funny you say that because I feel like I've, you and I have definitely seen and know that there are journalists out there that are, that are not, that don't move in that way. And I always, mm -hmm. I always feel torn about it because I feel like sometimes like there's ways in which being kind of a jerk can really help you as a journalist and, and, and not just in terms of like getting ahead, but actually like it's, it's good for journalists to not care a lot about what people think of them. Right. Like, I, and mm -hmm. I know some journalists who like, they're kind of weird people mm -hmm. <laughs> socially <laughs> and, and don't actually have like good senses of empathy and grace, but also like, they don't care if the governor is furious at them. And like, that's great. Mm -hmm. And, but you can't practice journalism as it should be practiced without yeah. real empathy and without sort of keeping this centering people's humanity to people you're, you're, you're writing about, um, but I think it, it makes it it makes the job harder in certain ways. Definitely I mean, does. like actually caring about what you're reporting mm -hmm. actually takes a lot out of you. And I say this is someone who's like a very privileged person yeah. and like the degree to which I care is sort of just like they're my politics. It's not like mm -hmm. it's not like right up close to my face and my skin yeah. color and my and my family and my people and all that. But caring creates an extra emotional burden. Um but I also think that it makes it makes the work better, I think. Well and also it's like, you know, the way I present myself, however I present myself, you will believe me. And I think sadly we see journalists who come in like a bulldog and most people are just people. So, so they'll, they'll bow to that. They're intimidated by that. You come in with your suit and, and, and the way you speak to them and even a little bass in your voice, you can get people to move around. You have yep. to be very careful about how you use your energy. I could yep. use my energy. I could turn on. Sometimes you have, to, you have to get that bass in your voice and like look somebody right in their eye and say boom, boom, boom to move. Um, but I also think that to your point, there have been a number of stories, especially with these families impacted um, by police violence, where I, 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 I fell back myself because I didn't like the way I felt like I was moving with them and mm. forcing them to ask, que answer questions again and not give them a private moment. There were moments where I intentionally, I think, and I'm not saying I've had, I have a great career and I've been able to do everything I've wanted to do so far and I continue to grow. Um, but I think if I was more of a bulldog, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it would be a little different because I, I still know. bring my skill set and I could also not care. <laughs> but I'm I know, like... I know. I'm I'm jealous of the people. I'm some. I feel the same way sometimes. I even feel this way with like, you know. I even feel this way with people in power who who you should be. You know, sometimes you should be ruthless with. Where like, I have to muster that up because there's still that empathetic part of me to exactly. thinking about the other human being on the side right. of it, even <laughs> when that person represents power. When I was a police reporter, obviously half the job was dealing with um, the victims of gun violence and families of, of perpetrators and suspects. But I also spent a lot of time around cops. cops. And, and a lot of times I do empathize with humanity and understand yeah. the frailties. People are frail. And frail. so yeah. in talking to cops, sometimes I'm like, so uh, did, did we get them or what? what? What's the thing here? Not necessarily that I, but I always felt like the relationships, right? Yeah. Understanding how you, I understand how you're seeing the lens from which you view these situations. And so I, I would find myself, um, and I always came at them hard because you're the institution, you represent an arm wing of the state. So, in, so we work for the people. Um, but it is dangerous because then it's like, and I can understand a little bit sometimes, right? Your humanity. Yeah. You're yes. Because humani you're humans and you well, make but mistakes. That's to me, that's the, that's everything you're describing right now describes like the, the, the fundamentally unresolvable struggle of doing work that, that matters and is good work. And particularly mm -hmm. in the context we're in, you know, we're going to do a show tonight, an opening on police and like, just, you know, being rigorous and clear eyed and uncowed from, from power in how you describe what's happening mm -hmm. while also not losing your empathy, your open mindedness your ability to listen to other human beings who are coming at things from different perspectives to, to combine those two is very difficult. And I think you, you are one of few journalists, I think who does it incredibly, incredibly well, but it's a hard thing. And I think it, you know, to me, it's like <sighs> trying to get to that place now is what we need more than anything. Um, yeah. I mean, what we need is structural fundamental change to the systems of oppression. <laughs> that, but, that's, that's a good start. <laughs> that, that, that's number one. But, yeah. but, but on, the, on the means to get there, like, basically what makes this moment different? Because, 
you know, you and I have covered Ferguson. We've covered Baltimore. You were in New Orleans after Katrina. I think we both, you, you have more experience than I do, but, but, but I have some, and we've, we've, we've covered these moments of sort of uprisings, conflagration, police accountability, cycles of sort of national reckoning. Um, this one does feel different to me as well. And I just thought maybe we could end on like what, if it feels different to you, why it does. I think because, and this is going to be a kind of, a, I don't want to oversimplify this moment, but I think there is zero question that George Floyd should be alive right now and that he contributed in no way in his senseless death. I think the idea of, of the, the way he died, and again, we've, even when we say Mike Brown, um, should he still be alive? He should still be alive anyway, right? But there's murky circumstances. There yep, are some yep. things happening. A tussle here, yeah, yeah. a run, a hands up. Right, right, so yeah. people could say, you know, he, he shouldn't have done A, B, C, C or D. The, the kind of thing where it's like, believe me or your lying eyes. Yep. And being gaslit by the entire society who does not want to give credence to our lived experience about the way we're treated by this society. In this moment, it is crystal clear. And it speaks to this idea of how the black body and black people have been criminalized. This is the response from even if he, whether he knew or not, passing a counterfeit $20 bill? That's crazy. Wait, part. what? So one, I don't even, does, did he know? First of all, does he have a press in his basement? First of all, did he know? Is he part of some big scheme? <laughs> I had an email last night from a viewer that said, I know this is the least important part of the story, literally, <laughs> but... I would like to know, was it actually a $20 bill, counterfeit bill? And did he even know? Like, fully aware that that does, doesn't matter. But it's also like just this thing that hangs out there, like that started the whole uh, chain of events that led three to the man's cop, death. Three cop cars pull yeah. up because a guy bought some cigarettes, bought some Newports with a, a fake 20. And so it, it, speak, it speaks to the entire criminalization of black folks and how easy it is to take their life. But also, as, as Chauvin... Um, who, I, who I learned yesterday uh, was the training officer for a couple of those officers who arrived. Um, sounded like the worst teacher ever, clearly. Um, but the way he killed this man so easily because he he assumed he'd be able to get away with it. And, and that so black life is so easily snatched by the system. That police And then you have three other people, three other police officers who are there just as bystanders, right? So it, it, was, it, it was crystal clear the sheet, no pun intended, was ripped off of America and we see it for what it is. Um, and I think that COVID contributed to it, people being pent up, the, the feeling of being aggrieved and attacked on, on all fronts. Um, but I think the combination of the, the accretion of those other um, deaths in the, the week or two prior and then the yeah. way he died. I don't, I don't recall yeah. seeing one as clear, leaning on a guy's neck, eight minutes, 46 seconds. I completely agree, and I know, like you know, Almadou Diallo was a was a huge case here in New York, where a young mm -hmm. man was uh, in a entering his own building, reached for his wallet. He was lit up with fifty shots by police officers, and they were like, "We thought he was going for a gun." And like yeah. Michael Brown, like, "Oh, he was." There's always this this plausible cover, always mm -hmm. this plausible cover in these in these stories of we thought X, we thought Y, we didn't know there was a tussle, the cold blooded lynching that this amounted to. Cold blooded. Um, I agree. Um, <laughs> Tremaine Lee uh, is, is uh, the host of Into America, which is a great podcast. You should just right now, maybe you're like folding laundry, maybe you're walking your dog, maybe you're cooking in your kitchen and you're, you got like 20 more minutes on that. What you should do right now is you should go over, you should search Into America, you should subscribe to that, you should listen to Tremaine's podcast. Um, and uh, it, it, it is excellent. I hope that, that getting a little, uh, a little, window into uh, Tremaine's incredible brilliance uh, pushes you to do that. He's a Pulitzer Prize and Emmy Award winner uh, and, and a friend and a, a dearly, dearly uh, beloved colleague. Tremaine, thank you so much, man. Chris, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Once again, my great thanks to uh, Tremaine Lee. You can tell from that conversation, I think, what a special person he is. I'm really um, one of my favorite people that I've gotten to work with um, in my in my journalism career. I just, I think, my respect the hell out of him. Um, and you should definitely subscribe to Into America. You can tweet us uh, the hashtag WithPod. You can email WithPod at gmail.com. Why is this happening? Is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and Kate Shaw, and features music by Eddie Cooper. 
can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.